Hi, I'm Dr. Peter Litchfield, and it's a pleasure to be here with the Breath Hub. And I know there are a number of questions that are going to be presented to me here today. And the first question is uh, that I've already been given is a very basic question, an obvious uh, kind of consideration that I'm sure all of you are interested in. And that is, the question is, why should we be interested in breathing? Why should people in general be interested in the subject of breathing? Well, there it, it's a, a very, I think you'll find a very interesting answer, is that uh, a great number of people have uh, learned uh, bad breathing habits, and they get all kinds of deficits and symptoms and consequences, which are very unfortunate. They're extremely uh, common. Uh, for example, in the United States, about 60% uh, of the ambulance runs, according to a whole number of st statistics that have been taken over the years, are a result of people having learned bad breathing habits, the symptoms that come from bad breathing habits, where they feel so profoundly compromised that they, they call for an ambulance and end up in a hospital. And when they end up in the hospital, what do they get? They get a paper bag. They get a prescription. Uh, they get a referral. But the problem isn't really addressed. Maybe it's identified as someone who's hyperventilating, for example. They may be diagnosed, let's say, as, a, as someone who's hyperventilating, and they're sent home. And the next thing you know, two weeks later, they're back. They're back in the hospital again. An ambulance has come a second time. And then another two weeks later, uh, they're back in the hospital a third time. And it goes on and on over a, a long period of time, maybe many years in their, their lives where they end up in an ambulance. Most people, you know, don't call for an ambulance. Most people who have learned dysfunctional habits will go to a physician, get a prescription, uh, go to a health care provider of some kind, maybe to an alternative health care provider. Maybe they'll blame the symptoms on their uh, a disorder that they're, they're suffering with. Maybe they blame it on their asthma. Uh, maybe they blame it on, um, you know, the, the, some, some kind of um, issue that is related to stress or to anxiety or something like that. They try to find an explanation like we all do for our symptoms. And rarely do they end up thinking it's their breathing. Usually it's something, they're a victim of something somehow. And the healthcare provider doesn't, doesn't have a solution either beyond what the scope of their practice. So if they're a chiropractor or they're a physician or they're a psychologist or they're a counselor, they're going to look for some kind of explanation in their area of expertise and then try to deliver a service that's relevant to their expertise or make a referral to somebody else. And that person may go from healthcare provider to healthcare provider, one self-help book to the ne ne next self-help book, to one supplement to the next supplement, and on and on looking for some kind of a solution when, in fact, the symptoms and these complaints may be coming, uh, coming on as a function of a dysfunctional breathing habit that person learns. Now, one thing about dysfunctional breathing habits is that they all have triggers. Uh, they don't, it isn't like you're breathing that way all the time, that the problem will show up when the trigger is present. So when you're standing in front of a group of people where you have to make a public presentation, you start to take deeper breaths, you take control of the breathing, and then when you take control of the breathing, you do what we call overbreathe. And what does that mean? You lose too much carbon dioxide, which is a fundamentally precious substance of the body. It's something that's really good for you. You need to have the right amount of carbon dioxide because it regulates the fundamental chemistry of your body, like blood plasma. It keeps the blood plasma at the pH level where it needs to be. So now you take over the breathing. And when you take over the breathing, you lose that carbon dioxide and now you get into trouble. So maybe in a public speaking situation, because you feel anxious, you try to take control 
by holding your breath and you take the breath and you take larger breaths and now you lose that carbon dioxide that causes the blood vessels in your brain to close up, to constrict, and now there's less blood flow to the brain, less oxygen, less blood sugar, and you get real dizzy and disoriented, and that triggers anxiety, or it, and it, you, you can't find your memory, you've lost your memory because you, you, there's a state change, it's like taking a drug, you have a state change, and now you can't remember what you're gonna say, and now you really get anxious. And it just snowballs into a place where you just, you're dysfunctional. And your respiration is severely compromised because of the way that you are breathing, that habit that you've now engaged in taking over uh, the breathing and then compromising your respiration and getting the symptoms that then compromise your functioning as a public speaker. So that's an example of it. It's extremely common. It's estimated that up to as much as 25% um, of the U.S. population suffers from time to time with a breathing challenge that brings on all kinds of symptoms and deficits that typically are attributed to something besides the breathing, something else. They're a victim of something out there, like stress, for example.